<laughs> for, for, for the intended audience, I'm sure that's fine. I hope so. Um, we're going to have some fun today. Um, Gareth is with me. This is Rob Hirschfeld. Um, we're going to talk smack about immutable infrastructure, identity potency, DevOps, the, the gamut, try and keep it short. Um, for mature audiences, no, not mature audiences, for advanced <laughs> audiences, um, we, we, wanted, we wanted to get together. We were going back and forth on Twitter um, about these topics, and we thought it would be fun to just talk them through on the phone uh, and let you share in the conversation. Gareth, do you want to do an introduction for yourself, and, and we can start rolling? Yeah, kind of briefly. So, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Gareth Rushgrove, uh, basically Gareth R, everyone on, on the internet. Uh, I'm a a principal software engineer at uh, Puppet, uh, formerly Puppet Labs, and uh, also the uh, curator of the DevOps Weekly newsletter. Um, sort of somewhat software developers, somewhat operator occasionally. The more building tools for operators re in the sort of recent past. Excellent. And my name is Rob Hirschfeld. I am CEO and co-founder of Rack N, um, and we specialize in data center automation. A lot of hybrid. Uh, physical ops, um, uh, site reliability engineering, SRE, DevOps type thinking and thought processes and stuff like that. So we're both on the front lines of uh, what, I, what I've been seeing is a pretty big transformation in how people want to run infrastructure, um, very cloud first um, type stuff. Um, what are you seeing, Gareth? You know, what's, what's your impression on, on how people are, are transforming uh, from this perspective? Oh, broad question. I, um, I think it definitely varies uh, from organization to organization, region to region. Um, there's undoubtedly a huge amount of interest and movement towards uh, like using someone else's infrastructure, um, like getting out. Like, I'm, most organizations are like trying to get at least some parts of things out of their out of data centers, get out of the data center game where they can't do. Um, in some cases, yeah. that's they're all in on a on a sort of medium long term like everything public sort of strategy. In other yeah. like in other cases, it's very much like like ah we're dipping our toes in um, and everything in between. I think um, there's the the sort of breadth. I think one of the things that I find interesting from my my background was more building and running things. Um, working at Puppet, I'm mainly building things to help people run things. Um, so now I, I talk to a lot more customers, see what they're doing, and also hang around in sort of other tech communities. And just the breadth of things people are running at the same time uh, <laughs> is, is, is huge. Um, I, I, <laughs> that's the, to me, that's the real hybrid, right? When we talk yeah. about hybrid, what's hybrid? It's like the fact that people do everything without without making any decisions. Um, well, I, <laughs> like I think the the decisions are often local. I think that's yeah. the thing, and over time they add up. Uh, my previous job was working for the UK government, and some of the departments there. I, I remember someone saying, like, they're pretty sure they're. They they had licenses for pretty much every bit of software ever written, yeah. and he wasn't proud of this fact, but he wasn't joking either. Um, the just I... everything from everything from bare metal and mainframes through um, like public cloud and containers, uh, they were doing it, and I think most most large organizations look like that. Well, we talk about it like it's bad because you know it, it's definitely hard to maintain and it creates debt, but it's also what innovation looks like. If, if you were going to stick and say, oh, I don't want to use the new thing, then, you know, you're going to be vulnerable to, to you know, not being able to take advantage of those savings. You're going to have some false starts and you're going to have some islands where you're going to be maintaining something that's useful, but is using old technology, GASP, it might be in Java or something. Um, and, and instead of trying to you know, pull out those weeds, you need to figure out if you can sustain it. Um, you would you had said something that that I feel like is is really an interesting um, question that people are asking right we keep saying everything's going public right we're getting out of infrastructure um, and to me it's it that ends up being a sort of a silly statement of trying to predict your end end state I, but I do think there's a very clear this is going to get to the immutable infrastructure piece 
cloud first, right? If you're not using cloud, you're nuts. You must yeah. be using public cloud. If you if you think you're going to avoid that, it's it's just not a good business decision. Um, that doesn't mean that I think you're going to you know sell all your servers for junk if you're doing physical. Also, it just means that you better up your game uh, yeah. in doing that because the cloud operations patterns, which are fundamentally immutable, um, because you create and destroy servers so easily, um, are 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 really going to change the business of doing IT. Um, it's not even the tech. I th I think that one of the things there that a lot of the practices that in terms of like alongside the technology practices evolve. Like how do we, like, like how we can do operations today? How we can use software to like manage our software? Um, a lot of that has developed in the like in a sort of cloud first mentality in a cloud world. Like sometimes yeah. taking advantage of things like like sort of fundamental changes like uh provisioning time dropping so drastically um from maybe months to like maybe <laughs> maybe seconds or minutes and uh, like that means there are some things you can do and not do but all the practices that have evolved alongside those changes have all happened in the like the sort of that cloud first sort of group and I think then the t and it's those people who have built tools alongside those practices so you've so, so like not use not taking advantage of any of the cloud stuff like removes you from that innovation happening and I right. and I don't, I don't think so, uh, not all of that is fund is fundamentally about like, not all of it doesn't work elsewhere um there, there are tools and practices there that are totally back like can be brought right. back into sort of main, and mainframe confusing like um and any sort of physical stuff well this this to me is the bridge to immutability right what if if we truly have servers that can come up in seconds which we're, we do in cloud um a lot of times the configuration steps for that are considered more time consuming and expensive and you know so we've got a couple of problems right we've got servers that come up really quickly and then configuration steps that can take minutes yeah. which gasp minutes but you know we're going from a 20 second process and making it three minutes long and people are scratching their heads saying oh, that's too that you know i don't want to add that i want it to be i want it to be 10 seconds so they you know there's there's this idea and then they're saying well instead of reconfiguring it it, you know, and then keeping track of it. Now I'm destroying it and then building a new one. But from an inventory perspective, now I've got this, you know, I never know what's deployed in my infrastructure. I've got a much more dynamic, it's a totally different problem, right? We used to, you know, five years ago, we did configuration management. We'd, we'd provision a hundred machines in the cloud or on servers or VMs. And then we'd manage them and configure them. And then we'd patch them and, you know, They'd, they'd be up for weeks or <laughs> sometimes at least. Um, and now we're really saying, look, if I, I don't patch, I destroy. Uh, it's a real I, different mindset. I, I think like you touched on the important part there, which is like the time to live for that. Hmm. Because if previously you had machines that were um, up for, for, week, for like a few weeks and you were patching them, they were always patched. If you now treat them as something you don't patch, but you bring up new ones, then if they're still around for weeks, you have this gap. And I, I see that, uh, I, and I think people, I think that the patterns around immutable infrastructure, not all of them actually are anything to do with immutability. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna ask you to define that one. And yeah, so, I know when, uh, if you actually look at a de the definition of immutable, it's about cannot change. And a lot, I, I think one of the questions I often ask when people are saying, oh, they're, they're doing something, they're, they're using immutable, immutable infrastructure. Um, and I'm like, oh, are you using like read only file systems? Are you, and they're like, what? <laughs> um, right. But I think we've ended up conflating a bunch of actually separately useful things. Um, and the like just moving all of your configuration into build um like is a is a side effect like if you actually if you are actually running in a, an immutable infrastructure you are like using read on file systems you are saying like i this cannot be changed afterwards it is just a natural 
sullied off. It's a it's a build artifact from your CI CD yeah. pipeline, right? That's but that's the, what you're describing here. But one that can't change. Um, and at that point, well, of course, you're doing all of your config at build time because you literally you can't do it at runtime. Um, what I you you have to do some things at runtime because well, yeah. IPs, addresses, and names and yeah. right relationships yeah. inside of a cluster must be deployed time decisions. Right? Yeah, I and mean, well, things like that are often injected that are passed uh, like as a reference to the actual the artifact, the immutable right. thing. Um, but yeah, the the idea of you just doing build time config, and I think this is what some people like just they just do build time config, but they have no guarantees of immutability and they have long run like long lifetime uh, artifacts. And um, you you then have this sort of untracked like gap um, um, where you do, like it could have been you, your config could have been changed. Um, people often, I think, get stuck upon, um, and this is more a, maybe someone coming from a development background than an operator background, uh, that the only way of something changing is them changing it. So if, 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 <laughs> I, set some, if I set some config, of course yeah. it will stay like that forever <laughs> unless I change it. Um, it doesn't! Just heads up, everybody. And the, the yeah. reality in, like, and well, again, like people get sort well, of hung, hung up on like uh, removing SSH um, right. uh, for good reason because it's one of those things. Actually, if you're doing again, like there's sort of the, all these anti patterns around doing quote unquote immutable infrastructure, um, long long lived long living um, sort of instances um, mean that you have a more potential for something to change. If you've got SSH and people can log on. People can change things. So, um, so I, I, I want to. I'm, I'm going to break you for a second, and because mm. I, I, it's worth recapping to me what you're describing from an immutable perspective and one of the yep. benefits. If you believe that somebody change, post post deployment changing your infrastructure is a bad thing, and generally it, most people would agree that it is if it's not a controlled change, then immutability, which is not really immutability, but the idea that you are going to destroy machines destroy really de de destroy the configuration of a machine rather than change it and redeploy it from a from a, in one pass so it's really a it's not immutable it's a it's a moment in time single shot configuration and then you, you run the system and then you destroy it and then reconfigure it all together as a fresh image yeah which is where i think when people talk immutability they're really not you know what they're really saying is look i don't want to touch the machines after that first moment of inception yeah, um, I'm going to do configuration in Inception, uh, and there's a couple ways we can talk about it, doing that. But then it's going to run, and then I'm going to destroy it. And the faster I do that process, the less risk I have of configuration drift. Yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, and that's it, an important the, concept. Yeah, it, like I think for me, like I, what what I what I want in that world is technical guarantees of immutability, mm. um, rather than just um, like like risk mitigation, um, I, I, in particular when I think, I mean, like if you look at sort of the, I mean like Netflix who really sort of pioneered a bunch of sort of tooling around all this, like their their lifetime for the for their machines was really short, um, and they were their their point was actually that's our risk mitigation. The, the, the like the instances are living for such a short period of time that. Um, they don't like well. We we our tolerance for drift is uh, is fine. Um, I see people. I see some people adopting the same sort of yeah. build time config set setting, but actually having instances running for a long time, and with SSH or like other things on there that doesn't actually account for the fact that like uh, things can change. Um, and I, I, I think it's just we're not quite like the the defaults. The the pe people who do do that really well. Um, I've had to do some of the hoop jumping themselves. And, and yeah, I mean, when, when we look at the, you know, and the pattern, the pattern that I see in cloud is using cloud init. So what, what people do is they build configuration. Basically they're, it's, it's a file. If you're not familiar with the cloud init pattern, um, you should definitely look at it, especially if you're a physical operator and you're like, oh, I'm not worried about the cloud stuff. Um, this pattern is coming to a data center near you mm -hmm. really quickly. 
Um, and the idea is that you have a source controlled configuration file. Um, and basically the, your machine boots reads that file, does whatever post configuration step is necessary. And then you are done ever configuring the box. If you do it right, you shouldn't, you know, there's no, um, CMDB system. There's no Ansible, Puppet, Chef, mm -hmm. Salt in there. This is what people want to do with CloudNet. They want to CloudNet, they're done, the system comes up, lives its life, and then if you need to change it, you reboot the machine and go through that process again. So you change the CloudNet file, and you reboot the machine, and you go back through it. Um, it's, a cloud, it's a cloud pattern because it's super easy to do that in cloud. It's, it's, you know, that's how you, you, you test your configurations. On a physical infrastructure or where you're working with long-lived um, running instances, that is not as easy a pattern to implement, right? If you're taking down a data, part of a database cluster and you're planning to only reconfigure it by rebooting the machines, um, it's possible. It's just a lot more work. Um, I think that for me that, that like there's sort of this, there's a spectrum there with I mean, like with how clouding it gets used. Okay. Um, in that, I guess on one ha on one end of that spectrum, you've got uh, it being used for literally everything. So from from well, basically from a base operating system. Mm -hmm. um, everything you've pushed everything into cloud in it. It's all it's all done at, at like at sort of provision time. Um, you're installing packages. You're doing stuff over the network. You're putting files down. You're doing like the, like just classic sort of configuration, and and you've pushed all of it to that point. And I think on the other end of that spectrum, the only things you do in cloud in it are actually uh, the sort of unique configuration. So. Uh, like sort of service discovery type bits and pieces, and you've built an artifact. You've built an AMI on uh, Amazon. You've built a uh, VMware uh, VM, and like mm -hmm. with all of your like with the with config files down, with packages down, with things that are like general for that type of image that you're making. Your the, well, the VM that you're launching, or right. instance you're spinning up, um, and it's just the last mile in cloud in it. And I think the, that's, that's you see, definitely the cloud. That, if, if you're in cloud, you, you definitely don't want to be repulling packages every time you exactly. build the machine. And, and that's the thing. You, you end up with people along this spectrum. And I think yeah. a, a good practice is to get as close to um, like, like that, that last mile being as, as short as possible as fast as possible. Well, I mean, that's to me, that's what people end up doing with Docker. So Docker is sort of this hybrid in between those two stages. So in a, in a um, containerized scenario, you have a minimal machine and then all of what you just described, the AMI images are not delivered by the AMI. AMI is actually pretty lightweight. Then you're now pulling the server image, if you will, as a container, um, which is, is, you know, at the end of the day, ends up not being particularly lightweight at all, especially because you end up with each, con it's, now we're back to AMIs, where each, AM each container has all of its dependencies and libraries and things like that. So where you might have had one server that had all that stuff in it and it, you distribute it with the AMI, now you've got to redeploy uh, well, you, whatever you, your container yeah, is. Yeah, and you've got sort of like, there's two, there's, there's ultimately multiple layers there, and each of them has their own sort of like, how much do I do at build time? How much do I do at like sort of runtime conversations? Right. I think the, the the interesting thing with Docker and like the sort of container sort of tool chain is that that was fundamental from the start. In right. that, like, you can't do anything with like like you start with Docker build. It's it's a fundamentally like there is a build thing and a run thing, um, and like that. So that spectrum doesn't exist in quite the same way. Do you, um, do you think that, cl that Docker build is in some ways parallel to a cloud knit from that perspective? No. Okay. I, so I think, um, I think cloud, like the, I guess like the, the analogy for me there would be, uh, either, well, some of the terrible things people do in uh, like Docker runtime, like sort of, uh, <laughs> like run scripts. Uh, and they are terrible. That's the right word. There's some... well, it's like it's it's you can do. I, 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 I think the the sort of the environment invariable injection 
uh, like from the Docker interface ah, right. is the sort of, I guess that's the, because that's the, that's the runtime config. That's the last mile. You cannot know until you run it. And that's, that's like how oh. you can use cloud in it. But again, like I think with, with cloud in, you do see people using it for, di for different things in different contexts. Well, we're, we're actually seeing a different pattern or we're trying to implement a different pattern with this. Um, and you, you just added a, a, a gray zone to me in this, in, in uh, what we're seeing. So on one side of this pattern, we see people who do configuration, um, right? One of the things that, that our, our uh, project does, which is DHCP and integration, typically you do by building a big configuration file using a, a CMDB and then restarting the service to reread the configuration file, um, which can be, which requires you to access the machine and then you know, run, is do configuration steps because you're building a file. You have to know 100% of what's in that file every time you build it. Um, well, and we don't, I don't consider that particularly cloud native. I think that's more yeah. traditional. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have completely API driven infrastructure where you don't get any entries in the system at all, except by doing API calls where they're added, you know, by, by API. So it's entirely re effectively, entirely remote. There's no pre inject configuration. Um, the, the command line parameters you're describing are almost a gray zone where you're saying, look, I'm going to, drop materials on you at boot time to do this configuration. Um, but it's not a file based configuration. I'm not archiving it somewhere. It's I'm injecting it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think that I, I, I remember from configuration management camp a couple of years ago, a few of us were talking about the sort of different speeds of configuration in that you've got, and you, you've got some com some configuration information that's that is incredibly static um through like not not just from the point of view of like a running thing but often from the point of view of like all of the build artifacts like maybe maybe the last 100 or 200 or 300 like build artifacts vms or containers or whatever had this had the same configuration value um and you've also got some config which might be changing every minute or could change every minute or every like or faster right. mm -hmm. um and that sort of especially if you're in a i, I think well, i think like load balancers are, are a sort of classic example of this like the, the sort of the traditional like we have a, we have a fixed number of machines we add we add to them very slowly um right. the speed of the like the load balancer like well what what nodes do i have what are my balancing between it doesn't change very often and the the the, to the tools you might use to change that and manage that are different to if you're running like a sort of cloud load balancer and you have instances coming up on all of that. Like they're diff they're different problems, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where we that's that time and speed like again like like is something that is that drives sort of different tools, different sort of approaches. So, I mean, one of the things that we started with was this acceleration. What you're just, what you're describing to me is that the acceleration is real. That we're, you know, when somebody says I need to shave 30 seconds off my provision time, um, you know, that that's, that's actually a, a material savings when you're talking about, you know, immutable bring ups and dynamic load balancers yeah. and, um, you know, patching code by bringing up new servers and, and decommissioning old servers. Um, Right, the idea that you could you could make a big a, a big difference in timing could be a big a big a big factor. Well, I, I think partly if you're, it, it, I mean, it comes down to sort of cost. The the cost of not shaving that time off is often well, you're paying for that time anyway. Right. Um, in a public cloud, because you're paying for like when it's you're not pay, you're not paying for it when it's ready for you. You're paying for it like. When it's when it's right. like it's like the, but well, it's in when production, yeah. It, yeah. Um, the other side is, yeah, if you're trying, if you're again, like trying to save money by not over provisioning and uh, like using sort of auto scaling groups or basically like actually dynamically growing your environment again, the, the, the like getting the tweet, getting the sort of configuration of that right such that it doesn't over provision because things aren't ready because that that's the that gap between oh i've launched instance oh it's not in the load right. balancer yet it's not in the load balancer yet because it's not ready um oh let's like do like getting that getting that right and getting it 
good enough so like you can actually like your your service scales up not just your infrastructure scales up um but like the, the the harder the like the more you pressure you put on like the the like that provisioning time to get it low the better all of that works so yeah i i, I agree with you but I, I still think that the models i'm seeing are actually even are, are different have different justifications than that that we're mm. we are not seeing and i'm thinking like bosch and infrakit um you know uh, as um as sort of examples in this terraform a little bit but not as much where it's where the idea is not that I'm, it's not a capacity based need, it's actually a versioning based need. So my continuous deployment system is actually, you know, my ability to roll a patch is specifically bounded to how long it takes me to provision new machines yeah. into my into my deployment because they might have a one line code change patch and I'm constantly going through this cycle. And you're right. So if, if it takes an extra 10 minutes and my machines only live for an hour because I'm patching every hour, yeah. then, then that's, a, you know, that's a 15% overhead in cost, which is significant. Um, but, e but even so, to me, this mindset is, you know, we've got this, you know, I make a change to the code and all of my, I, I've, it ripples through my entire infrastructure. Um, yeah. And like the, it's the sort of, I guess, like what's, like what? What does that wave? What, what does that wave look like? What's the wavelength for changes? Right. Um, and I think as well, like as well, one of the things that I think has definitely been true in the last sort of bunch of years, like performance is a developer experience issue as well, um, because like ahead or like while you're actually while you're doing that while you're building your tool chain while you're actually like trying something out testing something out and having like we know from sort of like unit testing sort of woe and pain like that the faster this like the faster your feedback cycles the better like you're able to sort of just get on with your job and i think that performance of like build or provisioning things is, is totally a like developer experience sort of boon or problem so i i want to do a science fiction check with you <laughs> on this because what we're describing you know hopefully to the people listening to this some of them are are going to think we're nuts um but my experience has been that this is really what developers are building that when we're looking at ci cd and build pipeline tools um when i look at what the kubernetes community is expecting people to execute on um, this is how infrastructure is going to be deployed and managed um is being deployed and managed yeah. and it's it's it will be coming to a data center near you. Is that, you feel like, you know, what's the time frame? Yep. So definitely agree. It's definitely the direction of travel. I, th I think one of the things you touched on there, which a lot of people in my experience from that, like the community you described, which I count myself as part of as well, is like often miss is uh, like the critical importance of like, like CICD sort of setups. Like I think lots of people take for granted, of course you're doing that. And actually, in lots of large organizations, like still, like that, that's a new practice. And before you, like, before you jump into going, like, oh, immutable infrastructure or containers or communities, like, get really good at, like, get, like, really sort of eat the elephant of CI/CD. That's that's the that is like the ability that gives you the ability to start creating artifacts. That gives you the ability to get to this sort of like pattern. Um, that like is incredibly fundamental and i think often taken for granted a bit because like for for people who are more cutting uh, like more on the cutting edge it's yeah, not a new sorry. thing it's not a new practice well actually lots of large organizations that is a new practice so yeah you're 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 getting way close to my heart on battle scars for this um right we're you know my my specialty is is data center automation right we're trying to make bring these cloud practices that we see incredibly powerful um and and you know cloud first is the right way to go but people do run infrastructure they both have you know legacy workloads and they're trying to spin up you know they want to control their infrastructure so people run metal they have reason to run metal i don't want to get into that battle i think it's simpler to say there will be a percentage to be determined between one and 99 that's cloud and yeah. not but it's coming and um, what we see 
happening is most people's infrastructure has none of these controls. You know, they're, they're still manually provisioning, they're, they're using tools that are very fragile, that you know, what we're talking about works in cloud because the, the automation targets are there. In your own data center, it's not, and you have to move sideways to fix that problem. Um, I was just having a conversation with a customer about exactly this. They're like, we did all this work and we don't have any new features. I'm like, you have to move sideways first, yeah. then you can accelerate. Your, um, yeah. you, and you have to fix your technical debt to get into a place where you can reboot provision really confidently with an API so that all that stuff goes and goes and goes and goes. What we're describing is a totally uh, different approach to infrastructure. It's much more dynamic. Um, it's much more automated than people well, are I, used to. I think that's the, I, but the, that move to software and that sort of infrastructure as code. Yeah. And, and, and I think also uh, like sort of very much like runtime config, like as in like the, where the configuration actually comes from the network itself. Like the, all of those things are underpinned by ultimately software development. It's it, like, it's, mm -hmm. It's it's you're going to write some code. You're going to have a version control system. You're going to have a, a like continuous integration. You're going to have some sort of like build and run stages, and you need all of that. It's like you are not I mean, like you are not going to succeed with the new tools. Like you're not going to be able to take advantage of any of that sort of the new stuff without that. And okay. that's a, that is a like that is a big mind shift it's a bit it's a it's an effort within a, like any large organization to adopt that and even for new projects and never mind actually then like the sort of whole scope of uh, sort of existing infrastructures um i want to come back to something uh, you mentioned as well and, yeah. and pick on it a bit cool uh, so uh you said there's n so, something along the lines of there's no need for a, sort of like a cmdb um, <laughs> I, I, words I, for I you. Go ahead. I obviously work for Puppet, but I fundamentally disagree in that. Uh, I want to know. I want to know about the configuration, and that's I mean, like a, the, the CMDB is is a database of the configuration of my nodes. Um, yes. Now, the sort of the classic um, sort of I guess seems to be of oh, it's a spreadsheet where where people fill it in as they're wondering like when they make changes to the day i mean, like obviously that that that's terrible anyway that, that i mean there are software applications that can sort of like take some of that on but again they're mainly yeah. guis over fundamentally the same thing and it, uh, like that doesn't work because of really just again like the speed of change the scope of change the fact that people are not good at repetitive tasks are, like nearly no one has a good story about that sort of cmdb one of the things about yeah. um like i guess tools like puppet or like others like they're like often people view them purely as a like you write some code and make a change um actually what you get out of a load of that is a an entire database of like all your configuration data over time yeah. um and even if you're not doing uh, sort of like runtime changes. I you're in an immutable world. Um, like, like we have a read-only file system. You can't change anything. It's great. Um, I still want to know how that machine is configured. I still want, e even if it's like last, not lasting for very long. I still want to be able to know. Are all are, like, are all my machines the same? Like, even just that simple question, and. Like, especially as you get into sort of, I guess, uh, more regulatory sort of compliance or like audited environments, um, the idea yeah. of not being able to ask questions about my infrastructure like scares me. Um, so I, I think you are you are hitting on a, a fundamental truth, right? Configuration management is a required function. It. I, I think when people think about these tools, they get very caught up, I know I do, in what they do on the nodes to enforce a configuration. Um, and you know, with cloud init or you know, immutable infrastructure, you still have to manage and drive configurations. 
you're just not necessarily doing it on the node as an agent yeah. anymore. And so that this to me is is and and we're we're just about we're a little over thirty minutes, so we should we should wrap up. Mm -hmm. But you hit the fundamental truth, right? It's configuration is still required. We're changing the way we're doing it. We're moving where it is done. Yeah. Um, but we're it's never going to go away. You have we, to have to have it. We're changing the sort of the I guess. Like I want to, I want to manage configuration at a higher level. In some cases, I want to manage configuration. Some configuration is incredibly fast, and I want to just hand that over to the network. Some of it is actually, I want to like say, no, this is this, this is slow moving. I want to manage this here, um, and all of these things are happening at the same time. Right. And I think like like any tools, tool like the tools are still evolving to solve all these problems. And I think for for me as well, one of the sort of interesting things there is just like the like because people are still running everything like you're, you're like most organizations like especially large organizations are like like you said like hybrid their hybrid is they're running yeah. everything and like again like having specialized tools for each individual area on a scale so far um but specialized tools will always be like i guess further forward or better for like in the local sense and then you've got the sort of global sense where it's actually but i am doing all of these things at the same time and now i have 20 tools to like do all these things there's this interesting balance there i think when and it's in particular around like configuration especially because a lot of these tools are emerging at the same time as the practices that accompany them, <laughs> like and, 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 and yeah you, you can't you, yeah you, it's a lot of sideways motion to keep switching tools which is not desirable. So this has been fun. Um, I think yeah, we covered a lot of good, a lot of good ground, brought up some real issues. Um, we have really kept this non-commercial, right? Uh, you want to take a second and, and talk about what your day job is and what pays the bills. I'll do the same and then we can sign out and oh, we're going to no contact you. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I'm, uh, I, as mentioned very briefly, I work for uh, puppet. Um, so we sell, um, Puppet Enterprise, which is a commercial distribution of the open source Puppet stuff that lots of people will hopefully be familiar with. Uh, it's a configuration management tool. Um, it will help you manage your infrastructure pretty much where whatever infrastructure that happens to be. Um, uh, my day job is mainly focused on, I guess, or has been focused on a whole bunch of how does Puppet work in sort of cloud environments? How does Puppet work with containers? So uh, doing a bunch of work around both publishing our software as, as containers, but also then tools to interact like with the Kubernetes API. So um, all sorts of interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, if people want to contact me, uh, just drop me a line at uh, gareth at uh, puppet.com. Awesome. And uh, I'm Rob Hirschfeld. I'm Zehicle, Z-E-H-I-C-L-E online. Um, my company, RackN, focuses on bare metal infrastructure automation. So we have a project called Digital Rebar, or rebar.digital is the project website, uh, open source scaffolding that lets you do this full life cycle automation uh, that we've been describing, right? This, this type of high turn rate, you know, reboot, reprovision, manage infrastructure connected to things like Puppet um, and other tooling. Um, actually, we're about to launch a, a beta uh, where we, we can actually do uh, distributed management of multiple data center endpoints. It's super cool. So uh, check that out. It's going to be fun. Uh, and you can follow, you'll see it on Racken or, or Zeehicle. So cool. Gareth, I appreciate the time. Uh, no, cheers. This good is the end of the week for you. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no problem. No, it was good.